We've heard a number of scriptures that were read a moment ago. I want to share one more with you and just reflect upon with it with you. I hope you'll reflect with me on this as well. And then we're going to have commun communion together. This is a passage that I know many of you are familiar with. <clears throat> but it is nonetheless a passage that we need to revisit from time to time. And it comes from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. And of course, I'm talking about chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. If you want to join me there for a moment. We live in a time in which there is a lot of attacks, a lot of criticisms about our faith, concerning our faith. Um, if you spend much time on the internet, you can see that it happens all the time. And if you watch YouTube videos, which I do, you can see that there's a lot of YouTube videos that are directed at our faith. They make fun of us. They criticize us. They say we believe a bunch of nonsense. Um, and one of the areas that is attacked most often is this, what, this very thing we're celebrating today. Uh, there are some people who do not believe that Jesus even actually existed. They deny that he existed. They believe he was a mythological figure that was created by Christians. One of the things that cannot be denied, if you know anything about history, and if you know what the historians say, is the fact that this person we worship, Jesus of Nazareth, actually did exist. You cannot deny that. There's way too much evidence. It's overwhelming. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But just to show you how important this celebration is, the resurrection of Jesus is, uh, and to realize that it was attacked from the get-go. I want to look at this passage because it was. Paul was writing to a, group, to a church in the city of Corinth. And they, there were people there who had problems with the resurrection. It's obvious that that is the case by virtue of what he writes. But he does something that I would do. If I knew something was true and there were people who were doubting it, I would give evidence. This is worth believing. And let me tell you why. There's, there's evidence for this. And this is what he does. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at it with me. Verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel, the good news I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. You can see he's expressing a little bit of doubt there with them. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. 
And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be the most pitied, he says. But in fact, Christ has been raised, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You see what Paul does? He recognizes that there, he probably got word either by a letter or someone brought the message to him, that there were those in this church who were denying the resurrection. And Paul responds to that very clearly, very, very effectively by saying things that if you think about this, he's going out on a limb because these things could all be checked out by these people. He, he lists a number of eyewitnesses, not just individuals, but groups of people. And he says, most of these people are still alive. He's inviting them to check it out. These are eyewitnesses, he says. They're eyewitnesses to the faith. And he lists not only himself, but James. This is not James, the brother of John. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Remember in the Gospels, James was an enemy of Jesus. Something's happened to him. Obviously, he's seen his half-brother Jesus alive again after his crucifixion. I don't know about you, but I can imagine. That would have a huge impact on this guy, wouldn't it? He doesn't believe his brother's the Messiah. He sees his brother crucified. Then he sees him raised from the dead. I think that would change his mind, don't you? The same thing is true with the Apostle Paul. He himself mentions this. He says, it is only by the grace of God that I am even here because I is, I am the least of the apostles because I persecuted the church of God, he says. He was out dragging Christians out of cities, out of churches, putting them in jail, overseeing their execution. But he had an encounter with the risen Christ. He saw him raised from the dead. That radically changed him. Now you might be thinking to yourself, maybe he just had an hallucination. Maybe that's all it was. He was dreaming. He had an hallucination. After all, people do that, right? I've talked to widows whose husbands have passed away. And they have these encounters with their dead spouse in their homes. They believe they do anyway. That's called a hallucination. Of course, we know, psychologists tell us this, that this is a projection in the mind. There's no one really there. But it's a, it's a mechanism to help deal with the loss. Is that what these guys were having? No. It's impossible. Hallucinations do not happen to groups of people. They do not happen to groups of people. And what does Paul list here? Not just individuals, but groups of people. It cannot be an hallucination. It doesn't work. Just look at the scientific data. It doesn't work. He's going out on a limb here because these people can verify this. And the interesting thing about this is, is that these people were willing to die for their belief that they saw the risen Christ. Now that might not seem all that exceptional because we know that there are lots of martyrs, people who are willing to die for what they believe in. That doesn't make their belief true. It just confirms that they really believe something. But there's a difference between those kinds of martyrs in these kind, because these are the actual eyewitnesses. They're not believing the word of someone else. These are the people who claimed that they saw the risen Christ. And if they were making up this story, would you think they'd be willing to die for it? If they were making up this story, if they were lying, if they created a fabricated myth, do you think they'd be willing to die for that? Probably not. Probably not. It's very unlikely that all of these people would have gone through the persecution and have many of them were killed for their faith if they knew that they were lying about it. That seems completely incredible to me. And it should to you as well. That's just not how things work in the real world. <laughs> if you still have doubts about the resurrection... 
Let me give you a little bit of legal help here. Um, the Guinness Book of World Records records the fame of a, of a defense lawyer by the name of Sir Lionel uh, Look who, who has an unprecedented 245 record setting consecutive defense murder trial acquittals. It's a mouthful. Consecutive 245 cases he defended in one, all in a row. Okay? So he, he himself, by the way, is a believer in the resurrection. This is what he had to say about that. He said, I've spent more than 42 years as, as a defense trial law, lawyer appearing in many parts of the world and am still in active practice. I have been fortunate to secure a number of successes in jury trials. And I say unequivocally, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. He's not the only one who has to have said this sort of thing. There are a number of people who were challenged to check the evidence out who did and came to become believers in Jesus. They said that the evidence was overwhelming in support of the resurrection. Now, I don't have time to go over all that with you today. There's plenty of books that have been written that deal with this issue. But I can tell you, I've, I've looked at them, I've read them, I studied them when I was in seminary as an apologetic student. And the what evidence is overwhelming. All this nonsense that you see on the internet about the copycat theories. I was talking about this Wednesday night in our Bible study. You know, that, that these disciples, they just borrowed things from the ancient pagan mythologies like Horus or Mithras. They stole these ideas about the dying God and the rising God from the dead who had 12 disciples like Jesus did and so on. They borrowed all that and stole it and made up this story about Jesus. It's all baloney. It's all nonsense. That's not how it happened. In fact, historians tell us this. Historians will tell you that if you look at the, the mythologies of Horus and Mithras, they don't line up at all with the story of Jesus of Nazareth. They don't line up at all. These, guys were, these gods were not gods who rose from the dead. They, were not, they didn't have 12 disciples. They, did, they weren't born a virgin. None of that's true. But that's what you see on the Internet. That's what you see on the Internet all the time. The Zeitgeist movie, I don't know if anyone has ever seen that, that was popular a number of years ago, which unfortunately wrecked the faith of a lot of young people. It's based upon complete fabrication, made up stuff. It's not good history. So history's on our side. And that's the great thing about being a Christian. We have a faith that is testable. A lot of people don't. A lot of people don't. Islamic faith is not historically credible. The Mormon faith is not historically credible. It's easily debunked historically. Not so with Christianity. It's based and rooted in historical fact. And that's what gives us the confidence to be able to declare it. Because God did not leave us without witness. Jesus himself in the Gospels appeared to his disciples over and over again, showed himself to them, because like you and me, I'd be skeptical too if someone came back from the dead. I'd want to have a, more than one encounter with that person just to confirm it. And Jesus did this for his disciples. He invited them to touch his body in Luke's account and said, see that a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He ate food in their presence. He's not Casper the friendly ghost. He's a real bodily risen Jesus and that's why Paul can speak boldly and say the things that he does to the Christians at Corinth to encourage them not to take this lightly because he says here if Christ is not raised your faith is futile you're still in your sins every one of your loved ones who has died is gone you'll never see him again and we are of all people to be the most pitied but then he responds by saying, but in fact, Christ has.
been raised from the dead. This is what gives us the hope that we're going to see our loved ones again one day who have gone before us. They're going to be raised from the dead because of their faith in Christ. Miss Emily, the rose here is for her. We're going to see her again one day. Jackie Johnson's going to see Marie one day again. And all of you who have lost loved ones, I, I can name several of you. One day, you're going to be reunited at the resurrection, and we're all going to be gathered together again. I had, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but I, I, I sat with Larry Cantrell yesterday in, in his hospital bed, and we talked about these things. His biggest concern is the future. I want, I want things to be set right. I want my family back. I want my friends back. Is that not the desire of all of us? Because we live through our lives. We lose friends and loved ones. People's lives are wrecked by the things that come into our lives in this world. Suffering, sickness, illness comes into our lives and it wrecks our families. It wrecks our lives. It bears heavily upon us. And I told him, I read to him these very passages that have been read to us today. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus said to a grieving Martha whose brother had passed away. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die shall never die.